Welcome, everybody. My name is Rebecca McCaffrey, and I am the current president of SCB North America and a co-chair of this meeting today. On behalf of the SCBNA board, my co-chair is Real Borakini, our irreplaceable director of operations, Megan Kevel, and all the volunteers who make these meetings possible. It is really a sincere pleasure to welcome you all whether you're attending here in person or if you're joining us virtually, to the 2022 North America Congress of Conservation Biology. It has been quite a journey to get here to this point today. Our last in-person Congress was back in 2018. And since then, of course, we've been confronted by a global pandemic, new challenges in racial and environmental justice, political polarization, extreme climate and weather events, and isolation from our families, peers, and networks. At the same time, we've found new and creative ways to communicate and connect. We've supported each other within our communities and across our networks. We have witnessed, organized, and participated in grassroots protests and actions. And we've doubled down on our work and its importance to thriving communities ecosystem integrity, and the conservation of biodiversity. This is reflected in the theme of our meeting this year, restoring connections and building resilience in a changed world. As many of us here in Reno look forward to connecting and reconnecting in person this week, we've also built a program that is accessible to the many of you joining virtually and we're really looking forward to hearing about the creative interaction between our in-person and our virtual audiences. Further, as a professional society, a community of conservation professionals, and a global community of citizens, we also look to places of personal, professional, ecological, and social resilience. I hope that this week's program provides inspiration, new ideas, and new con conversation in a diversity of levels. I'm also happy to share that our Congress this year coincides with Latino Conservation Week, an annual initiative of the Hispanic Access Foundation showcasing outdoor engagement and conservation advocacy by Latino communities. We will be sharing resources and events and amplifying voices throughout this week, so please stay tuned. Finally, as we kick off this Congress, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the many individuals and groups making this meeting possible. First, I'd like to thank our North America board and staff. Um, I'm just one member of a fabulous board that's dedicated to advancing the work of our society. We thank the board members rotating off this month including Gerald Singh, Melissa Cronin, and Jessica Pratt. And we welcome our new board members, uh, Brendan Reed, Martha Groom, and Anna Weber. Thanks also to Megan Kevel and Jules Duran, who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to make this meeting a success. We're also grateful to the sponsors who helped make this meeting possible especially in supporting our efforts to create this hybrid event. And next, a huge thank you to the many folks who have served on our organizing committee, working on everything from our scientific program, to our designs, to field trips and local resources, to work on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and more. And a very sincere thank you to all the volunteers and who are helping to moderate sessions, work the registration desk, and help with IT and keeping all of our sessions running smoothly, both in person and online. And finally, I want to thank all of you, our members and participants, for sticking it out with us over the past years and the past few months to be here today. Ultimately, the strength of our society really depends on you, a diverse, connected, and active group of conservation professionals and students. And so I'll end with a request we really hope to hear from you throughout this week. Our society's structure is changing, as you will hear about, and the ways that we move forward as a section, from how we communicate to the types of programming we provide to how and when we meet, 
will only be strengthened by your ideas and your participation in that process moving forward. So please come chat with all of us on the board and staff, or drop us a line to share your thoughts and even learn how you can get involved. We really appreciate it. And with that, we now have a pre-recorded remark from Tony Lynham, president of SCB Global. I'm Tony Lynham, and on behalf of the Board of Governors for the Society for Conservation Biology, I'm excited to welcome you to the North American Congress for Conservation Biology 2022. We are delighted the NACCB is going to be an in-person Congress, but that some participants will have the opportunity to join virtually. I wanted to say a few words about the society and what we do. We're a global community of conservation students, scientists, and practitioners. We're a membership-based organization, and we run conferences, publish journals, and run a fellowship program. We currently have more than 2,600 members across 113 countries. The society was formed in 1985 in response to the emergence of a new crisis discipline, which was called conservation biology. Our mission is to advance the science and practice of conserving the Earth's biological diversity. Now, we can say that conservation biology was originally conceived as a field that included social science, genetics, wildlife health, environmental monitoring, natural resource management, and others. Our current view is that in order to protect nature, we need to take a much broader approach. And this needs to be an interdisciplinary approach that recognizes the many dimensions of conservation science. At the same time, we need to embrace the diversity of the membership within our society across six regions, chapters, global programs, working groups, and task forces. We want to empower our members and ensure that our business model ensures sound practices for promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion across the network. So we're reorganizing the society to better support our members and the important work they do. Our six regional sections and local chapters will become part of a regional council that will rep represent and support SCB membership. On the other hand, our working groups, global programs and task forces will become part of a programs council that will chart the vision, mission and storytelling of SCB. We'll have a new governance structure and business model to support this transition. Ensuring justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the way we do business is central to this new model. If you're interested in learning more about the transition and the relationship between the global society and the North American section, please join the SCBNA members meeting on Tuesday, July 19th at 4 p.m. You can also visit the SCB booth to find out more about the transition. Well, this year we have more than 500 participants registered for NACCB. There's an excellent mix of plenary talks and speakers, and the sessions will allow you to reflect on the conference theme, which is restoring connections and building resilience in a changing world. And thank you to the institutions that are supporting the Congress, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, Wilberforce Foundation, Turner Endangered Species Fund, the Bureau of Land Management, Conservation Science Partners, the Center for Biological Diversity, Compass, and Stonemeyer. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank a number of people who helped make this Congress happen. First of all, the Steering Committee, Israel Borakini, Rebecca McCaffrey, and Megan Cavill, and also the Scientific Committee, the DEI Committee, and committees concerned with sponsorship, student affairs, financial awards, field trips, sustainability, and abstract reviewers, moderators, and of course, to all of you, the participants. So finally, I hope you enjoy your visit to Nevada, and I hope that you'll enjoy the program. Have a great day. Okay. Um, next, I'm thrilled to introduce Herman Fillmore who is the Culture and Language Resource Director for the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. Miwanga wat mi bi, washoe ilu, haliza digam di alei, debo ilu Herman Fillmore digam di alei, washishu kum danu, 
Lei, di goi bini filmor ash di la lora filmor degum di agei. Bow de dei lei ash bow lukum danu shilu lei. Um, welcome here today, everybody. My name is Herman Fillmore. Um, my parents are Benny and Laura Fillmore, and I'm from the Carson Valley, and I'm of the people of the valley. Uh, today, I'm here as the Culture and Language Resources Director to give a brief land acknowledgement and talk about the homelands of the Washu people. Um, so as you can see, this is a map that was created um, way back in the 1960s. It comes from the Indian Claims Commission, Docket 288, which was our case for our homelands. Um, the homelands of the Washoe people once extended from Susanville to Mono Lake, from the Great Basin to the foothills of the Sacramento Valley. Today, our homelands consist of four reservations or Indian colonies, as well as allotment lands and trust lands. Reno was once called Welganuk in recognition of the meadows, um, and the marshes here surrounding what's today known as the Truckee River. At the headwaters of the Truckee, we called it Debayodawe. As, as it came into the Truckee area, we called it Shuekwata. And as it headed into the Great Basin, we recognized it as Awakuwata. For all of the various resources, fish, plants, and things that depended on this place beyond human beings. So as we gather here today, I want to recognize each of you for the work that you're doing to create policy, to protect these resources, and take care of our homelands again in the way that many of the indigenous peoples from these places once did. You know, this is a cool conference because we are able to share knowledge and recognize that there's an intersection between our communities as far as scientists and indigenous peoples, and that we need to work together to take care of these places for the future. We call our homelands Washishu Ede, and I'm here today, um, sorry, today we are here to acknowledge that the land in which we are today are the aboriginal lands of the Washishu, the Washoe people, or as they are known, the Washoe tribe of Nevada and California. The city of Reno sits on the aboriginal lands of the Washishu, and prior to settlers arriving was recognized by the marshes, rivers, and resources that once thrived here. While the history of colonization has not been kind to indigenous peoples, it is our responsibility today to create a better future as we all face the harsh realities of climate change through increased wildfire, wildfires, ec ecological collapses, and extended droughts that are now common in this region. So as we prepare for the conference, North American Congress for Conservational Biology, let us both acknowledge the original stewards of this place, the Washishu, and let us think of the ways in which we can, through our daily lives, support indigenous peoples and be better stewards of these lands we also enjoy. In our creation story, we talk about coming here as seeds, cultivated by Nintishu, old woman, and growing from this land itself. Nintishu, uh, in her original teaching, she told us that it's our responsibility to take care of this place, to make sure that our medicines, our plants, and our animals will always be here, and in return, all of those things will always provide for us. And so today, my challenge to you, as you leave this conference and return to your homes and communities, I ask that you learn more about the tribes and indigenous peoples whose homelands you reside today that you think critically about what you can do to support tribes and indigenous peoples locally and globally, that you reach out to tribes and indigenous peoples and organizations to get involved in issues important to them, that you respect the land in which you live and as you travel and, and travel as the people who cared for these lands since time immemorial. At the Washu tribe, we just recently passed a resolution declaring a state of emergency for our language. We have 1,413 tribal members, and currently we have 12 fluent speakers, mostly above the age of 70. And so when we talk about this as an issue in the United States, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. Pre-colonization, there were roughly 300 distinct languages in North America. And of that, there are roughly 187 that are still alive today. And less than 40 of those are still being taught in the home. And so when we talk about this loss of bio, our 
biological diversity and the ongoing changes that we face for the future. We also recognize the decline in indigenous peoples as far as our communities, our cultures, our languages, and our connection to place. We once stewarded these lands from the tops of the mountains to the bottoms of the valleys, and we hope that one day we can take care of these places again, together, all of us as a community. Dinga Aledi, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Herman. Uh, finally, we have a recorded message to share from Nevada's Governor Steve Sisolak. Hello, this is Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak. I'm sorry I couldn't join you today, but I'm honored to send you this brief message. I'm thrilled to help welcome you all to Reno, the biggest little city in the world, for this critical conference. Nevada is the 10th most biodiverse state in the nation and we're committed to protecting and improving that. Biodiversity is integral to our lives and our livelihoods. We need to work together across all state lines to protect our planet and to protect each other. With the mounting impacts of climate change, biodiversity conservation is more important than ever. We're facing severe drought, wildfire risks, and invasive species, with some of the worst impacts hitting BIPOC and underserved communities the hardest. Nevada is committed to being part of the solution, and we've taken strong steps to create thriving biodiverse ecosystems and equitable communities in recent years. We've treated and restored hundreds of thousands of acres that are at highest risk of wildfire, and we've protected over 125,000 acres of vital sagebrush habitat through our innovative sagebrush conservation credit program. Earlier this year, we launched the Conserve Nevada program to help environmental, recreational, and cultural preservation projects throughout the state with plans to invest more than $217.5 million over the next decade. I also signed two shared stewardship agreements with our state and federal partners to protect our state from future wildfires and to advance sustainable, equitable recreation opportunities for all families and visitors. And we're actively working with California to protect the iconic beauty and biodiversity of the Lake Tahoe Basin, just about 45 minutes from the Reno Ballroom. I'm so proud of what we've achieved, and I'm also grateful for the many actions taken by the Biden administration at the federal level to protect the environment, including through the America the Beautiful and Justice 40 initiatives. My administration looks forward to continuing to work side by side with our many partners, including everyone here today, to help lead the way to a vibrant future for all. Thank you. Okay, and now it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's plenary, Dr. Justin Brashares. Justin is a professor of conservation science at UC Berkeley, who works with students, partners, and stakeholders in North America and overseas to advance the science and application of conservation biology. Justin's recent work has included research and leadership to support state, federal, and international 30 by 30 efforts. Justin. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca, and can't really see folks here, um, but some of you are out there. You haven't left for the slot machines yet, so thanks. We're, I think getting into um, another important and I think very meaningful part of tonight's plenary, plenary and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, the NACCB and ICCB have been uh, tremendous sources of inspiration and community for me for over two decades now. I'm aging myself a bit. Um, and this has been a rare place where I've been able to share my flawed science with the community that puts up with it. Um, joke. But, uh, you know, uh, false humility aside, I'm really happy to be here and to be talking about uh, what I uh, imagine uh, 
is the most important topic, I think, for the conservation community across our planet. Um, America the Beautiful, or internationally, the 30 by 30 effort has been called by thoughtful folks who are paying attention, uh, the, potentially the most galvanizing and important movement for conservation uh, in human history, uh, it, on our planet, in our lifetimes, and, and beyond. Um, and there are strong reasons and great reasons to believe that. Uh, but then there's also, as we've, many of us have gotten into it, realized there are incredibly, uh, incredible, uh, incredibly difficult and complex components of that, and, also, and also the critical need to think about conservation in new and different ways. And so I'm, again, excited and grateful to be here today and to have a group of experts, distinguished experts, who represent leadership positions in the federal government and in state, uh, state positions in, in state governments um, and who can provide us today with very rare insight into um, how this incredible initiative is playing out, again, at state, federal, and if we'll get into it, international levels. So I want to talk for just a couple minutes. I want to let our, uh, our smart people over here do most of the talking today. But I'm going to start just to get us all on the same page quickly about what we mean and what we're saying as we discuss America the Beautiful and the 30 by 30 effort. Um, and I'll do that very quickly, and then I will introduce uh, our wonderful panelists, and then each of our panelists will take a few minutes to give you a sense of the context of their perspective, or whatever else they want to talk about today for a few minutes. Um, and then we'll dive into questions. Uh, we have some set questions, and we'll see where they go. Uh, we're flexible. And at the end of that, we hope you all will have some questions for us or for the panel here, so we'll take some time for that. Um, and so let me jump in now to, um, if I can, if this will work, um, yes, there we go, thanks. So what are we talking about with America the Beautiful? Well, when, many of you know that 30 by 30 is a vi the visionary idea of conserving 30% of land and oceans, and it's being adopted, has been adopted by more than 60 countries now as a vision, and certainly by the U.S. and, of course, individual states. And um, where 30 by 30 is a skeleton of a brilliant, to some, very controversial to others, but um, of a potentially transformative idea, America the Beautiful puts the flesh on the bones in how the U.S. federal government views going about achieving that goal of 30% of land and ocean uh, under protection. And uh, many of you, uh, again, are very familiar with these details, but I think it's important to recognize, particularly in light of many of the controversies that are ongoing about what 30 by 30 and America the Beautiful represent and what it doesn't represent, is that America the Beautiful is presented as locally led and voluntary. Um, and the key tenets of this effort over the next now eight years, I suppose, we're getting closer to 2030, are that this, to achieve 30 by 30, this initiative and the efforts within it will pursue collaborative and inclusive approaches to conservation. Um, and that recognizes that uh, lands and waters should be conserved in part for the benefits of all people. Um, again, that it will be locally led and locally designed. So though it's federal, the idea is for it to be locally based. And in critically, um, related to our earlier comments, America the Beautiful, uh, uh, strives to achieve 30% of protection by honoring tribal sovereignty and supporting the priorities of tribal nations. So and this, is, of course, is a powerful statement and deviation from a history of conservation that has mostly displaced Native peoples. So here now the goal is to not only involve Native Americans in the formation of priorities and in that strategy, but also in receiving the benefits of this uh, incredible expansion in conservation efforts. Um, again, there's an emphasis on the, both the job creation and the health of communities associated with this effort, and importantly, honoring private, private property rights and working lands, and again, emphasizing volunteer stewardship efforts. Um, and this is something, of course, the conservation biology community has been waiting for, is the mention of using science as a guide in, in these efforts, and this is something we're going to get into much more. Uh, conservation science and the things all of us have been working on for so long and the field we've all been developing and shepherding. Um, and lastly, uh, both federal and state re efforts recognize that we don't need to reinvent the wheel in achieving land and ocean conservation and that all these efforts must build on existing tools 
um, and strategies that have shown to be successful. So that's, all that sounds great, at least it does to me, and it sounds you know, like how could you not support an effort that tries to do all of these things? Um, but as our wonderful panelists know and probably have extra gray hairs and other stress, um, actually getting, including those things and achieving the goals that are set out, that we're set out, setting out to achieve are incredibly con uh, complicated and of course controversial. So if I could go to the next slide. So uh, why controversial and why so complicated? Uh, 30 by 30, as I mentioned, is unprecedented in what it's setting out to do. Um, getting just the United States alone to 30% of land protection means more than doubling the total amount of land under protection. Um, as I've said in other talks, that's the equivalent of turning every state in the US that touches the Atlantic Ocean, to taking the entire Atlantic seaboard from Florida to Maine and turning it, all those states into a national park and you're still not there yet. Over here on our coast, it's the equivalent of our, all of our West Coast states, California, Oregon, Washington, add Nevada, um, and more that needs to be added under protection. So it's an incredible, incredibly ambitious and amazing goal in itself, and in such a short amount of time, and unprecedented. And of course, it's the, these challenges and this scale that has led to much of the controversy. On any given week or month, uh, you'll see a high-ranking politician refer to 30 by 30 as the, as the great federal land grab. Um, and this is a, a reality and a challenge in how uh, 30 by 30 in America the Beautiful has been perceived in what is a very politicized uh, country um, and, and in a very politicized discussion. And so furthermore, as you go about trying to achieve these mammoth, this mammoth expansion in conservation and, and, and protection of, of water and land, of course, critical questions come about as to what are we protecting exactly? How are we weighing these different priorities for conservation and protection? Where is that protection going to occur? Again, we're talking about massive new areas under conservation. Where is it going to happen? How is it going to be protected? These criti critical questions about durability. What, how do we ensure uh, the future for these areas? Um, and what are the strategies that we go about uh, doing that? And then lastly, and of course critically importantly, and something we're going to get into today, and that as a community we'll always continue to come back to, is who's making all of these decisions? If this is the greatest conservation action in our lifetimes, and we happened to be in the field that is being asked to lead, inform, guide this, um, who gets to say uh, how we prioritize these, these, different, uh, these, these different issues? Um, so with that, uh, I'd love to uh, introduce our speakers today and actually hear from those who are working on this and really getting in to the nuts and bolts of how this incredibly complex and difficult endeavor will play out. Um, so let's see. I am going to start with Dr. Heather Tallis. So uh, Heather is the Assistant Director for Conservation and Biodiversity Sciences and the Acting Director of the National Nature Assessment in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP, as many of us know it. In that position, Heather provides science input, I would say science leadership, uh, to the Biden-Harris administration's America the Beautiful effort and she leads cross-agency action on na nature-based solutions, and she worked with the U.S. Global Change Research Program to establish uh, the National Nature Assessment. Uh, through her previous work with the Nature Conservancy and the Natural Capital Project, Heather has design, designed and informed conservation practice with local communities, governments, and the private sector around the world. And Heather is gonna tell us more about uh, her work in a second. Uh, I next wanna introduce our next panelist, uh, Kim Tengarjaya, sorry Kim, I did it. And uh, Kim is the Deputy Director for Nature Conservation at the White House Council on Environmental Quality, or CEQ, as many know it, uh, where she advises on the development of science-based equitable strategies for conserving nature. Um, she focuses on the Biden-Harris Administration's America the Beautiful initiative, as well as habitat connectivity, wildlife corridors, and lands large landscape conservation. Kim is on detail or on loan to the White House from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, where she was the first biodiversity coordinator and supported implementation of the California Biodiversity Initiative. 
Kim also worked as the coordinator for the California Landscape Conservation uh, Partnership and worked for several years at the California State Water Resources Control Board. Joining us uh, virtually today is our friend, uh, Dr. Jennifer Norris. Jennifer serves as the Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat at the California Natural Resources Agency, or CNRA. Uh, and Jennifer le leads California's 30 by 30 initiative and oversees the cutting green tape effort in support of landscape scale habitat conservation or restoration. Jennifer has held numerous positions in federal and state government, including most recently as supervisor of the Sacramento office for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And she has extensive experience in conservation policy, endangered species protection and ecosystem management. And then last but not least, I introduce Director Jim Lawrence. Jim is the Acting Director for the Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, uh, the CNR. Jim has over 30 years of experience spanning all aspects of natural resource protection and land use planning in Nevada. He actively engages with Nevada's broad range of stakeholders, putting science into action to address the many contemporary and emerging challenges and opportunities across the state including advancing environmental improvement and sustainable outdoor recreation initiatives, overseeing the development and implementation of Nevada's cutting edge sagebrush ecosystem conservation credit program, and leading efforts to preserve Nevada's unique biodiversity and nat natural heritage. Sorry, Jim, there's your slide. And so with that, I'm going to pass uh, the microphone over to our guests, our panelists, and again, we'd, uh, we'll have a discussion about some of, some of these issues, and we hope uh, to take your questions, including questions from our virtual attendees, um, towards the end of the session. Great, thank you. Can you all hear me? I'll just assume in the darkness that that's a yes. <laughs> um, thanks for the introduction, Justin. I do sit in uh, OSTP's climate and environment team that's led by Deputy Director Jane Lubchenco. And we do have a number of initiatives that are responding to the Biden-Harris administration's recognition of three major global challenges, climate change, biodiversity loss, and inequity. And our efforts are all part of uh, the intentions to address those three challenges together in an integrated way. And maybe my slide will reappear so that you can see a summary of our initiatives that I'm gonna briefly introduce. So we have been focusing on uh, growing nature, better accounting for nature, and better knowing our nature. All of them in some way interact with and support America the Beautiful. So of course we're gonna talk a lot today about America the Beautiful directly, um, and OSTP is involved in that effort to make sure that science is at the table and as much as possible that the framework that's brought to bear on this um, is based in evidence and is as robust and transparent as possible. We also recognize that while America the Beautiful is as amazing as Justin mentioned, um, it is not all that we need. There's still the other 70% of US lands and waters, and for America the Beautiful to succeed, those also need to be sustainably managed. And so we have a new initiative that was announced um, in an executive order by President Biden on Earth Day around nature-based solutions. And this is one effort to drive increased adoption of investments across the country and across all parts of the federal government to invest in nature for benefits to the environment and to people. And so we're working uh, together with CEQ and the Climate Policy Office to produce a report that has um, new ambition and new opportunities for action on nature-based solutions. And while we have enough evidence to act today with America the Beautiful and these new investments in nature-based solutions, we still have some major knowledge gaps, which is why you all still have lots of work to do, um, that keep nature from being a core part of many federal decisions. And so we have additional efforts to try and make progress on closing those knowledge gaps. One that I want to mention um, has a lot to do with America the Beautiful. Uh, as an example, as those investments are made in the next eight years, all of your work will do a great job of capturing some of the environmental benefits that the investments make in monitoring programs and in evaluations. But the economic impacts that those efforts provide will not be captured in the ways that we currently do, for example, our national accounts. And so Secretary Raimondo, the Secretary of Commerce, announced during Earth Week that the U.S. will now produce natural capital accounts. This is a huge advance, and it will give us a way to start to actually keep track of the economic benefits 
that investments in nature like America the Beautiful provide. And then the final effort I want to mention um, broadens the picture even further because we all know connections between nature and economy aren't the whole picture. Sometimes it might seem that's the major uh, story we need to tell, but it's certainly not the only one. And so uh, we also announced in the same uh, executive order on Earth Day that there will be now a national nature assessment. And the president called for this assessment to give us a full picture of the status of US lands, waters, wildlife, biodiversity and ecosystems and the benefits that they provide. And so this work will let us uh, see in a much bigger step back how the long-term impacts of America the Beautiful are playing out, but also how nature is doing in the context of all of the other decisions that are happening. Um, and it will also very importantly bring to the fore some of the benefits that we often overlook, like the connections between nature and equity, climate change, the economy, um, and uh, national security and public health. So we really look forward to this comprehensive uh, stock taking of nature in the United States and how it connects to our lives. And so those are some of the major initiatives we have that will interact with America the Beautiful and I'm excited to discuss them more in our conversation. Thank you very much, Heather. Kim. All right, hi everyone. My name is Kim Tinger Jaya. I'm the Deputy Director for Nature Conservation at CEQ. And as Justin already mentioned, I'm on detail from California Department of Fish and Wildlife, where I usually serve as the Biodiversity Coordinator. So in that position, originally I was on deck to be leading the team that would develop the Pathways document for California's 30 by 30 effort. But in March of last year, I was looped into this detail to assist with the burgeoning national 30 by 30 effort. So as you all know, in May of last year, the administration launched the America the Beautiful Initiative, a decade long effort to support locally led and voluntary conservation and restoration efforts across the country to tackle the biodiversity and climate crises as well as address inequitable access to nature. The initiative also includes our first national conservation goal to conserve at least 30% of US lands and waters by 2030. America the Beautiful makes up the bulk of my work portfolio, and I'm involved in many aspects of the initiative, from reviewing public comments earlier this year to engaging in policy conversations to the development of the America the Beautiful Challenge. And if that last thing doesn't sound familiar to you, the America the Beautiful Challenge was launched this past April, and it's a public-private grant program administered by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation that will support lo locally-led restoration, uh, ecosystem restoration projects consistent with the America the Beautiful initiative. And the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation will leverage um, initial federal commitments of $440 million to raise additional philanthropic and private support with the goal of directing at least $1 billion in grants over the next five years. The America the Beautiful Challenge uh, coordinates funding from multiple federal agencies and private philanthropy into one competitive grant program, streamlining the application process through a one-stop shop solicitation and enabling larger, uh, more impactful cross-boundary projects. And I'll note that the first request for proposals is currently open and the deadline for applications is this Thursday. And so the final thing that I'll mention is that under the umbrella of the America the Beautiful Initiative, uh, we have a few interagency working groups that have spun up around early focus areas that were called out in the May 2021 report. And I have the pleasure of leading the one that's focused on wildlife corridors and connectivity. So we're thinking through how federal agencies can coordinate and align so that we as a federal family are providing uh, better support and service to the great connectivity and corridor efforts that are being led by states, tribes, and other stakeholders. So thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Kim. I'm going to ask our virtual panelists uh, Dr. Jennifer Norris to join us if you're there. Hi there. Hi, Justin. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Um, sorry, I'm not there. I would love to be sitting with all of you. Um, I will tell you just as a side note that my very first professional talk was actually at the Society for Conservation Biology. <clears throat> I remember being petrified by the 40 people who came to hear about 
bird uh, bird communities in northern Michigan. So being here at the plenary is quite the difference. Um, and I want to give a shout out to everyone who, if this is your first conference giving a talk, trust me, it does get better. So stick with it. Um, so again, I'm Jennifer Norris. I serve as the Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat at the California Natural Resources Agency. That's the California equivalent of the Department of Interior. We have about 19,000 employees in the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Water, Parks, um, uh, and so on. Um, so I support our biodiversity and habitat work across the state, and I do lead our 30 by 30 initiative 30 by 30 in California was established by executive order. Uh, Governor Newsom signed an executive order in October of 2020, so-called nature-based solutions executive order, which really elevated the role of natural and working lands in the fight against climate change um, and set conserving biodiversity really as an administration priority. We released our strategic document that uh, Kim just referred to, our Pathways to 30 by 30, Accelerating Conservation of California's Nature on Earth Day this year. And we are incredibly proud of this document um, in large part because it is a response to thousands of people who came and helped us put it together. We did over 17 workshops in the course of a year, talking to literally thousands of people across California about conservation of biodiversity improving access to nature and using our lands in the fight against climate change and got all of their ideas about what works and what the opportunities are. Um, and we really think of this document as, as the, a crowdsourced strategic framework. Um, we think this lays a very strong foundation for us to, to achieve 30 by 30 in California, to meet those three objectives of protecting biodiversity, expanding equitable access to nature and using land in the fight against climate change but also um, to do so in keeping with our core principles um, to advance justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, strengthen our tribal partnerships, and also uh, safeguard our economic security, um, clean energy resources, and our food supply. We took the bold move of trying to define what it means to conserve land and coastal waters in California. I won't tell you our definition because it's wordy, but at its core, uh, we believe that durable long-term protection for ecosystem function is essential. And based on that definition, California is currently at 24% of our lands are, are considered conserved and 16% of our coastal waters, which means we have 6 million acres to go on land and about a half a million acres left of our coastal waters. Um, our document lays out 10 pathways to achieve this goal. We too believe in locally led and, and are, expect this uh, initiative to be a locally led voluntary effort, but our pathways lay out how the state can support that work and really uh, accelerate all those activities on the ground, whether it's through policies, investments, changes to um, how we do our business every day. And that, those pathways include a whole bunch of things that you would expect, expanding uh, acquisition of land, advancing um, easements on private land, working with our federal partners as they implement America the Beautiful, um, and also making sure that those other 70% that was previously mentioned um, also support these conserved areas. We also put out a pretty amazing statewide geographic information system. We built this in partnership with Esri we now have uh, this interactive online map that anybody can play with uh, that, lays, that overlays our biodiversity data across the state, climate projections for temperature, sea level rise, as well as all the protected areas we currently have and whether or not they provide access to nature. Um, and so we hope that our partners can use that to really look in their region and identify conservation opportunities across the state. It also gives us a way to publicly track our progress toward the goal. Um, and finally, California is really making a significant investment in 30 by 30. In this year's budget, we have $2.1 billion with a B for habitat restoration, acquisitions, technical assistance, and um, $100 million set aside to work with our tribal partners to really advance uh, work on tribal lands. So we're excited about 30 by 30 in California. It is indeed complicated, but I also think it's a tremendously hopeful um, and forward thinking effort. And I'm really excited to be part of it. And I look forward to talking with you more about it. Thank you very much, Jen.
Director Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Justin. Um, my name is Jim Lawrence, and I serve as the acting director for Nevada's Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, welcome, welcome to Reno, and welcome to Nevada for those of you traveled. I've called um, the Reno area my home for over 30 years now. Um, I moved here from Eugene, Oregon in 1991 with the goal of um, getting one year of land use planning experience at Tahoe and moving back. So I'm a little behind schedule. Um, so a, a couple of things from Nevada's perspective. I, I will say that um, you know, a couple of things that I'm really proud of. Last legislative cycle for Nevada in 2021, our Nevada legislature um, passed assembly joint resolution, which was full support for the 30 by 30 initiative. Um, so Nevada is on board and we are working towards the goals of 30 by 30 or America the Beautiful. But um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Nevada's unique perspective. Nevada is a state that is 86% federally managed. Less than 1% of the lands in Nevada are owned by the state of Nevada. So what that means for the state to achieve natural resource goals, it really is all about collaboration and coordination. Um, we cannot do it alone and we can't do it in silos. Also look at this, um, you know, if any of you are familiar with Nevada, and if you're looking at 30 by 30 through the wrong lens of it solely being a land use protection, or basically a lack of development exercise, um, you could drive across the state and, and basically come to the conclusion that Nevada's there. Um, there's not a lot of development in a lot of Nevada's areas. But what we need is the conservation aspect, and that's really where we're focused on America the Beautiful. Um, wildfire alone, in 2017, we lost 1.3 million acres. 2018, we lost another million acres. Last year, um, you know, it was not too bad in Nevada, only 165,000 acres. But up here in Reno, for about four to six weeks, everybody that lived here was under hazardous air conditions, which basically, um, it impacts everybody, but disproportionately, it impacts those disadvantaged communities. So we really look at this as a conservation exercise, as much as it is a land use designation exercise. And a couple of examples, um, Governor Sisolak, who did the welcome uh, remarks, mentioned a couple of these, but I'll talk a little bit about, um, real quick, collaboration. We have stewardship agreements in place regarding wildfire, with the two biggest land managers being the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. We are proactively identifying those landscapes that are going to be the highest priority for pre-suppression work um, in order that we don't lose everything to catastrophic wildfire. I think we're also the first state that did a shared stewardship with outdoor recreation. Um, we recognize that Nevada, we are very fortunate to have a wealth of public lands, um, but we found during the pandemic that that can be a cost to the environment with, without sustainable recreation. So we're looking at it through the lens of sustainable recreation as well. Governor Sisolak also recently signed an executive order tasking our Nevada Department of Wildlife to work with all agencies and federal agencies regarding wildlife connectivity corridors and a sagebrush ecosystem protection plan. Also, our legislature and Governor Sisolak were basically doubling down and making sure that we're doing even more regarding tribal consultation and making sure that we're working with our tribal nations. Real quick on working lands, that is absolutely key from a Nevada perspective. Land ownership in Nevada, particularly in the rural areas, some of our most valuable ecosystems and our wild, um, for wildlife and our riparian areas are in private development and, and private ownership. So we work very closely with landowners. Um, one example is our Greater Sage Browse program where we use science to quantify functional acres to benefit sage grouse, and landowners can enroll in that system and they get compensated for conservation credits for enrolling that system. And then lastly, um, regarding investment, certainly all of our divisions across the state are, you know, have line items that will help with conservation, but very specifically recently our legislature and governor signed a bill for 217.5 million in conservation bonds for a variety of conservation activities, land protections, and some acquisition dollars. So, um, very happy to be here and talk with you all this afternoon, and um, welcome to Nevada again. Thank you. Well, 
Thank you very much, Jim. And we're going to jump into the question and discussion part of the session. And again, I encourage folks to think of your questions, and hopefully we'll get to them at uh, the end. OK, so with that, um, let's dive into this uh, discussion, this conversation here. And I'd like to start with, with Heather and Kim. Um, as our sort of uh, federal representatives here on the panel. And you not only are representing aspects of the, of the federal effort, but you in some ways, and not to put too much pressure on you, but you kind of represent this whole community in your roles as scientific advisors, scientific, uh, providing scientific guidance on the federal effort. And uh, you touched on some of this. Heather, you mentioned the need to hear from this community and for this community to support some of the science that needs to go into America the Beautiful. Um, but I'm wondering if you could specifically dig into some of that a little bit, each of you and your different, from your different perspectives and the work you do, and specifically about what you see as the role of science data or science, conservation science innovation in the America the Beautiful uh, effort and its outcomes and its effectiveness. I'll start. Um, I mean, there's an enormous role for science to play, and we could spend the whole week talking about this. So I'll just pick one aspect of America the Beautiful that has um, gained a lot of discussion in what you know science can bring to this and how we can translate that into a policy framework. And that is the focus of America the Beautiful on conservation outcomes. Um, that's certainly something that um, the conservation community thinks about a lot and talks about a lot and measures a lot and does a lot of science about, but that is new <laughs> for a conservation framework in the United States in the federal government context, right? A focus on outcomes. So um, it, there's another major part of this that Justin mentioned and a couple other speakers have already mentioned, and that is that America the Beautiful welcomes a wide range of actions that can deliver conservation outcomes. And that is based on science, right? That is informed by decades of research now that have shown us different and variable effectiveness of a wide range of management actions um, to produce benefits for biodiversity or climate change or equity, the three major outcomes America the Beautiful is focused on. So those two things are massive, and there's a lot of science to draw from, and it's also not perfectly aligned and clear uh, exactly what should be brought to bear. Um, but it is clear that we have an opportunity to draw from all of that science and try and build it into the initiative now. Um, I think a main thing that there's still going to be a lot of discussion about is um, how we do bring that outcomes focus into a framework. And one thing that is clear is that our current system of tracking uh, doesn't serve that purpose well for the whole range of America the Beautiful efforts. And that's the Protected Areas Database of the United States that was really designed to track protection. One set of actions um, that has been a core of conservation, but that's now being expanded beyond. And so it's clear that we have an opportunity to make some advances there um, and move beyond a focus on sort of management intent. Um, there's frameworks in the scientific literature that go beyond that kind of a framing and give us a lot to draw from um, that bring in other aspects like evidence of management effectiveness for a whole range of management actions and an understanding of variation in like the capacity of lands and waters to deliver outcomes. Um, so those are some of the areas that we're exploring um, to see how some of the existing science can be brought into the framework. But to be very clear, uh, this is hard, and it's not clear how far we're going to be able to go. But we are certainly hopeful in OSTP that the direction that the framework goes is, is really in support of conservation outcomes and moving beyond a focus on intent. All right, I'll try to add, but Heather already covered a lot. So maybe there's not much more for me to say. Um, but I will note that you know, pretty early on in this administration, there was a commitment to restoring trust in government through like, reinvesting in scientific integrity and actually incorporating knowledge and evidence into policy making. And for America, the beautiful using science as a guide is, is definitely one of the guiding principles for the initiative. And so I think when it comes to like the role of science, I mean science is it's it's helping us tell, you know, 
you're, it's going to inform where those places are that we should be investing in for biodiversity and climate resilience. And I think it's also going to inform you know, what types of strategies and what are the partnerships that are already um, in existence that we should be further building up and uplifting um, so that they can really deliver on these um, biodiversity, climate, and also the equitable access pieces. Um, so I think that's all I'll add to what Heather has already said so eloquently. <laughs> if, if I could just add, Kim, and put you on the spot, I, I warn these folks I might ad lib a little bit, but uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, part of how I know CEQ is sort of through its convening power, and also you have a tough challenge of sort of herding federal cats and trying to get different, and you don't have to name any agency as particularly good or bad. Um, but I'm wondering if you see a lot of variation in how science is viewed and incorporated across the agencies that you are shepherding. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm not going to call anyone out, Justin. <laughs> and I did forget to mention in my intro, intro um, in case those of you are not familiar with CEQ, uh, we're responsible for coordinating the federal government's efforts to um, improve, preserve, protect public health and the environment. So yes, interagency coordination all around. Um, and it's, it's definitely been, um, like, since there are so many agencies involved in America the Beautiful, um, I think I, you see a lot of, there's, there's definitely a lot of, uh, interest in incorporating science, um, but I think there are variations in terms of like the, the types of science that you want to incorporate, uh, just depending on you know, the, the stakeholders that you're, you're trying to uh, make sure that you're representing as, they're advocate, as these agencies are advocating um, for particular things through the America the Beautiful initiative. So yes, definitely a lot of variation, but I would say still very much um, across the board, a, a very strong commitment to incorporating um, science and evidence into this process. Thank you very much. I'm gonna direct our next question to Jennifer and Jim, um, if you don't mind. And each of you uh, in California and Nevada, uh, respectively, are deep into the challenges and realities of taking, in some cases, um, very broad science and actually figuring out how it's going to be implemented. So I wanted to ask each of you to comment on uh, the question, uh, what do you see as some of the major barriers to operationalizing or applying conservation science um, in implementing the, the 30 by 30 America the Beautiful initiative or in achieving the targets that those initiatives have set out? And maybe Jennifer, you could start with us if you're still there. I'm still here. Hi. Um... Yeah, I would say that the major challenges in applying conservation biology to 30 by 30 or science in general are the same ones we always have when we try to use science for policy, which is that there's this tension between getting something done and getting the perfect answer. And I hear a lot as I'm, you know, moving toward initiating or implementing 30 by 30, you know, how are we gonna know if we can serve all the right places or the best places, or how can we be confident that we're really doing it right? And of course, if you're a scientist, there is no end to the amount of information that would be adequate for us, right? We have a tremendous amount of biodiversity information in California, but there are many, many taxa that we don't understand very well. We definitely don't know enough about how species are gonna move in a future climate, You know how they're gonna get there, where they're gonna end up. Um, so there's just, there's so much knowledge that we need and yet we don't have time to do it all. So we have to get moving now. And so there's always this tension of um, good enough to get the conservation on the ground um, and if, if 10,000 acres that aren't perfect get protected, I still think that's better than losing them to the bulldozer. Um, but that, so that's one of them. I think the other one really is about um, equity. You know, we really want these initiatives to be regionally led. And there are parts of the state that have just tremendous resources, technical abilities, you know, 
I love the Bay Area, so I'm not calling them out, but they probably have 25 different green prints for which lands that are highest priority to protect under various scenarios. And then there are parts of the state that have zero, totally zero, and they don't have groups that are even beginning to have that conversation. So um, making sure that there are resources and that there is capacity for people to engage and identify the most important places and then be able to apply for the funds and work through those processes, um, I think is another big challenge. I'll stop there. Thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, thank you, Justin. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I, not a lot to add. If anybody ever says that California and Nevada don't agree on anything, um, this is an exception because I think uh, California, um, Jennifer really laid it out very well. I would add um, just a couple of thoughts to that. One, first and foremost, um, from, from my department, is just um, trying to find sustainable, ongoing funding for the science that we need to do is always a challenge. It seems that, you know, when I go looking for money, there's usually, um, I can have more success finding pots of money for infrastructure projects than I can for science. And, you know, just to get to that sustainable level where we can keep the science going year after year after year so we can actually inform and have a really true adaptive management cycle um, I, I see as a as a barrier um, Jennifer mentioned the, the time lag and as a policy person as somebody that you know will get funds allocated to my department we have a responsibility to get those funds on the ground as quickly as possible um, in order to deliver these projects. And so that time lag is real. Um, we're having to make decisions in a pretty quick time space, and we don't necessarily have the luxury um, to really wait um, for those science to, experiments to come and really fully inform us, which really gets to, and, and Jennifer touched on this again, is um, a willingness to take a little risk. Um, I, I think the landscape is changing faster and faster, year after year after year, and I don't think there's the luxury to wait for that perfect solution. So there has to be that willingness to take a chance, and um, that's sometimes hard to do in the political world. It's not um, necessarily a forgiving space. So, you know, there has to be an understanding that we need to make some decisions now, take action, but everything's not gonna be perfect. And I think that's gonna be really key and that's really hard to do in today's environment. And then lastly, a barrier is just uh, communication. Um, to the general public, you know, sometimes it's hard for them to understand just how important this is. And when we're talking in a scientific space, sometimes that message gets lost to the general public. And if we're really talking about working lands and voluntary efforts, be able to communicate down to, um, to, the, to the average person that's not a scientist so that they can understand the need. Um, so I see the communication as a barrier as well. So. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'll just add as a little editorial, one of the things that has struck me so much about attending this conference for 10 years or others is, and in this uh, conservation biology community is just the absolute explosion in what I'll call algorithmic conservation science. And it's what many of us work on. And it's why, you know, Google Earth in many ways is one of the most powerful agents in, in potential in conservation science or things of that nature. But it is, it is fascinating and really important to see as these programs try and develop how algorithmic approaches really do struggle with to include, you know, really consider issues of equity and do struggle to deliver on the true meaning and intention of locally based efforts. Um, so I hope that's something we come back to because of course as a community, uh, that's one, one of the things we've spent so much time developing is, is, um, is are, are those really data intensive complex approaches and now we're sort of being asked to look at them hard because they're actually gonna be used or are being used. So let me continue with the questions I wanted. Um, sort of continuing on that topic of equity, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and you know there is both at the state level and then certainly in America the Beautiful a real emphasis on equity, on access for all, on alienation of none, ideally. And so um, this is something for you, Heather, that has come up uh, that you've been a leader. And I mean, throughout your career, as I've known it, and working with the Nature Conservancy, and now working uh, with the federal government, can you talk a little bit about specific ways in which you feel equity is informing 
America the Beautiful prioritization or implementation? Sure, thanks. And I'll focus on the science side of it, the, the framework consideration of what's being brought into it. Uh, Kim can talk more about the engagement side of it, the actual process, if you want to get into that. Um, on the framework side, I think there's two main aspects of equity that are in the conversation. One is on the need for inclusive process uh, for conservation outcomes to be achieved from the science side of actual evidence of the outcomes that come from more inclusive processes. And then the other piece is on uh, how we actually identify places where conservation investments can improve equitable access to outcomes. So I'll say just a little bit about each of those. On the inclusive process side, again, it's just more and more and more evidence uh, from more and more and more contexts that inclusive processes yield better outcomes um, across the board. And so we are paying close attention to that and, and thinking about what uh, the literature shows in that regard. And some of the elements we're aware of and thinking about are um, the importance of having ongoing engagement throughout the conservation process, not just an upfront uh, solicitation of engagement or an upfront consultation. Um, also, the importance of processes where local uh, communities, tribes, and native communities and stakeholders have enough capacity and resources to engage. Um, we have done a great job as a conservation community of asking for input, and that's not always easy to show up for um, equally across the groups we're trying to engage. So that's very clear. And then finally, that where relevant, uh, the process of actual co-management uh, should certainly be encouraged and supported. So we're moving beyond consultation and information sharing to actual joint decision making and uh, knowledge development uh, over the process. So that's certainly present and something it's very beneficial that the, the community has uh, published on and put attention to and you know raised case examples and, and frameworks for this to be part of the conversation. The other part that's being considered, I'm just going to be honest, is very challenging because it's pretty underdeveloped, and that is us actually knowing where and how conservation investments can improve uh, access to outcomes equitably. And America the Beautiful talks about equitable access to nature's benefits, not just to the outdoors. So we're not just talking about physical access to parks, which is pretty well treated and there are good data sets for. We're talking about access to regulating services that help deal with climate change. We're talking about water quality improvements. We're talking about heat stress. We're talking about mental health benefits of living in neighborhoods that are greener. And there's a ton of really good research and data sets that show risk and prove inequity. And very few, and if any of you know of them, please come tell me about them, very few that show where and how conservation will cause marginal improvements in that inequitable distribution. So that's a big gap, and it is what we need for something like America the Beautiful to really be able to identify where investments will make a, a benefit and an improvement. So we're still looking at all the ways we can use existing data, but to me that's a real challenge and a real barrier that we can really use the community's efforts to help fill. Yeah, thank you very much, and I'm really grateful for the really targeted request because that's meaningful. Information, not request. <laughs> okay, information, request for information. Um, I want to turn to uh, Jennifer Norris with a similar question. I know, Jennifer, from working with you on this and seeing your work that California has been, um, has been very invested in equity from the, from the very beginning in this initiative, um, including in efforts to engage uh, California's tribes in the 30 by 30 effort, both from the earliest involvement in formulation and priority setting and then to execution. Um, but of course, working, working with sovereign nations it has challenges in itself, as well as some of the things Heather was talking about of ways of trying to quantify really how we have an impact on the equity front. I wonder with that rambling intro, if you could just comment on, on that same question about how equity has been included in your process and what you see as uh, its involvement in the execution of 30 by 30 in California. Yeah, and I'll talk about tribes in a minute. I just wanna echo, you know, California has a similar view that, you know, access to the outdoors in terms of recreation is a key piece of um, equity and certainly something that we're advancing, but it is not the whole story. Um, having equitable uh, participation in the process and, and as well as access to nature's benefits. I think we use that same phrase in our, our document as well. Um, 
And to that point, you know, really looking for those parts of the state that just don't have very robust um, conservation processes in place uh, and working with them to um, move those forward. But on the tribal front, uh, we actually, before we started any of our workshops, we initiated consultation with all California Native American tribes, not just the federally recognized, um, and offered early conversations and consultation on the process um, and have been, it's been an ongoing dialogue and it will continue to be an ongoing dialogue as we, as we have developed our draft and as we move forward. And we met with over 70 of those tribes, um, several more than once, um, some in informal conversation, some in formal consultation, we had listening sessions and our, um, our tribal partnership uh, piece of our document as well as the actions that flowed from that really reflected um, those conversations very directly um, and, and some of the desire for shared um, knowledge, uh, co-management as was mentioned. Um, and so I was really gratified. We had some follow-up meetings after the document was released and um, one tribal partner said, you know, there is just such incredible strength in this document and we're so grateful that you listened, which was really heartening. Um, but that's just a document and putting your money where your mouth is, is what really matters. Um, and so I'm also really proud that California, and this came from those listening sessions, you know, recognize that tribes aren't on an equal footing when it comes to um, any of these processes and that, you know, they, they said over and over, you know, just to apply for these grants, you know, you need to have capacity and you need to have um, expertise and it's tough to compete against you know, I'll pick on the Nature Conservancy, you know, they've got all these people that know how to work the system. And so it's hard to get in line. Um, so what California did was uh, of, we had a $768 million set aside for implementing our, our pathways document when it was completed, as well as a companion document that is um, uh, our climate smart lands strategy actions that we can take to advance climate action on our lands across California. And we took a hundred million and set it aside for tribes. Um, and we're gonna develop a tribal um, natural resource council that will actually help us figure out, it'll be tribally led, um, how to use those funds, how to ensure their equitable distribution. So we're really, um, and, and not just on those documents, but also on all the natural resource work we do across the agency. And that's a down payment, $100 million is not enough, but um, we think it demonstrates sort of where we want to take this moving forward and how important this is to our, our, our effort moving forward. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Jim, you mentioned earlier the importance of working lands, and I think that's certainly, uh, including working lands in America the Beautiful and 30 by 30 efforts, as well as conservation broadly. And uh, I'm, I know that that uh, reflection goes far beyond your state and, and is being discussed broadly about um, sort of how, you know, how we can do conservation differently, how we need to do conservation differently in order to achieve the, the, the powerful goals of, of America the Beautiful. And I'm wondering if you could talk about, based on your experience, uh, strategies and actions for including, engaging, working in private lands in America, the beautiful, or in conservation efforts generally, uh, in your experience in, in your state and beyond. Yeah, thank you, Justin, for the question. Uh, as I said in my intro earlier, I, I am a firm believer that working lands um, needs to be a strong part of this. And, um, you know, largely, you know, we're all, we all view things from our personal experiences. And like I said, I've lived in Nevada for 30 years and I've worked a lot in the rural landscape. And I have really come to appreciate two things. Um, one is just the land ownership and pattern of settlement in Nevada means that some of our best, most ecologically rich areas in the rural landscape are, are private lands. They're private working lands. Um, secondly, um, I've also come to the conclusion meeting with these landowners and with these ranchers and these agricultural producers that these are folks that have been on the landscape for a long time and they've gone from generation to generation and they are committed um, to doing good conservation work. Um, in fact, they um, 
a lot of that I talked to, they wanted to carry on the tradition to future generations, and that's getting harder and harder for them to do. So I think one of the keys to, to bringing the landowner in is one, you have, to, you have to get out and meet with them. You know, it's, it's not enough to put something on a website or, or send something out. Um, really to go out to these working lands and out in the rural areas to sit down with them where they live and where they eat and where they work um, and build those relationships. Because what will happen is there's a, there's a common understanding that starts to be formed and then you start to get your goals and priorities. Um, I'll, I'll use as, as a quick example our Sagebrush Ecosystem Council. Um, that's a governor appointed council largely focused on greater sage grouse, but it's on the sage grouse sagebrush ecosystem. And we have private landowners on that council as well as nonprofit organizations and local governments. And they all collectively work together to come up with a science-based model for valuing functional acres for the value of greater sage grouse. And in the previous federal administration, um, there was an IM that came out that questioned whether the Bureau of Land Management could require mitigation on public lands um, for greater sage grouse. Well, our Sagebrush Council that had private landowners on it and representatives from different industries, when that instructional memorandum came out, they all unanimously voted to pass the state ordinance to require mitigation, whether you're on public lands or not, and to use our conservation credit system. So I don't think that could have happened without having those conversations and meeting with the folks and really coming with a perspective that we all have the same goals. No, nobody disagrees that conservation is important. We all have disagreements on how to get there. And so really it is, again, it's, it's cooperation, collaboration, and coming to that common, common understanding. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And I wanna take that same question to Kim a little bit. I know your, your ex expertise and a lot of your time lately has gone into thinking about connectivity, wildlife connectivity. And, um, and of course, in that context, as we all know, we're very often looking at mosaics of land ownership and use and very often, uh, whether it's about movement or minimizing human wildlife conflict or livestock wildlife uh, predator conflict or other things that uh, we need to engage. And, and as Jim was saying, we need to get on the ground uh, to really engage folks and, and build partnerships. And it seems like there's some exciting things happening as we think about the federal government um, the traditional biggest lever seems to, in my estimation, is the food bill, which has been used for conservation through CRP and other things. But it sounds like there's n new efforts and new ideas around how to engage private lands and working lands in other ways of, of improving connectivity, whether it's through fence, you know, changing out fence programs or, or looking at um, non-lethal wildlife management or other things. So again, with that rambling intro, I'm wondering if you could comment on the, your perspective on, on approaches towards private land, working land conservation through CEQ or, or through your other roles. Sure, thanks, Justin. And actually, I'll, I'll build off of what Jim was talking about because I think the examples you gave really kind of illustrate why under the America the Beautiful initiative, you'll always hear folks saying locally led and voluntary because those are really the crux of being able to get the conservation work done, um, having those relationships at the local level, those tr that trust. Um, and so I think at, at CEQ, what we're really doing is looking to um, support those uh, efforts and programs that already exist at a lot of agencies that incentivize the, the voluntary um, conservation from private landowners uh, like Working Lands for Wildlife under USDA, uh, Partners for Fish and Wildlife through the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'll also note the, the recent um, Migratory Big Game Partnership that USDA announced with Wyoming and Justin and Jim, I'm sure you're also both familiar with this, um, and that's really drawing from um, farm farm bill programs and really leaning on those to connect with private landowners to do more like great conservation work on the ground for um, migratory big game populations. So I think we we're, we're really trying to elevate those types of programs and um, fully rec like recognizing and respecting the the rights of private landowners in the process. 
Thank you. Sorry, I misspoke. I said food bill. I meant farm bill. <laughs> that, that's what I figured. You <laughs> yeah, meant. sorry. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for that. I have a little bit of a slightly, well, I don't want to say it's a nerdy question, but I threw it in there because, um, you know, over the next four days, uh, I would imagine the term resilient or resilience will be used over a thousand times at this conference, and it's because we use it a ton as a field. Let's face it. Um, but my own sort of nerdy um, concern about that is that I think if we asked every member of this audience, uh, everyone would have a slightly different definition for what they mean by resilience. And resilience, though, I'll note, none of you have used it today, which is amazing, but it appears a lot in these documents. And I'll just say resilience will be used at this conference, as it is in those documents, to refer to climate resilience, which could be about refugia or connectivity or the future, as, as uh, Jennifer was talking about, where, the, where, where will these ecosystems be in the future? It can be about the resilience of socioeconomic, sociological structures. Or where can we ensure there will be support for these efforts over the long term? Or that term, it's often used uh, interchangeably with durability, the, the idea that it, the, these changes, this conservation will be resilient into the future. And then there's ecological definitions of resilience that you all know about, where it, in some cases it equates to diversity or redundancy or other things. So having rambled and said all of that, I'm wondering if any of you uh, would be interested in just touching on how you see, or how you see resilience as a concept operationalized uh, in the work that you do or in the folks that you work with. We should let Jen go first, since she is virtual and can't raise her hand. No, it's OK, Jen. Um, <laughs> at CEQ, uh, definitely, Justin, very much correct. Resilience, uh, depending on what, what contents you're, context you're talking about it in, has a very de different definition. Um, and just a couple examples that come to mind, uh, at, specifically at CEQ, with the connectivity and corridors uh, interagency working group that I'm leading, you know, we're thinking about resilience there more in terms of like wildlife and ecosystem resilience. Um, but if you kind of move over to the, the coastal resilience uh, working group that CEQ also helps lead or co-lead, um, there they're thinking more about resilience in terms of like communities, so more from the, the human dimension. So definitely um, a variety of ways to talk about resilience, just depending on the, the situation you're in. I'll jump into, um, in addition, oh, sorry. Do you wanna go, Jim? <laughs> um, in addition to the ones that Kim mentioned, you know, one of the things we're thinking about a lot is really multi-benefit um, projects that, um, you know, will build resilience to the effects of climate change in particular. Um, you know, one of the really, big things we're investing in in California this year and next and probably forever is, you know, rebuilding our, um, our wetland, our freshwater systems. You know, we've got severe drought. We're looking at future climate conditions that will mean very different uh, water supplies and having uh, projects that, you know, restore, for example, floodplains that will allow for more groundwater recharge while also providing for habitat. Um, those are the kinds of two furs or three furs that we're really looking for that I think um, will build resilience. You know, we're asking, we're asking our land to do a lot. You know, if we're only talking about 30% that we're setting aside, that's not very much for the thousands of species, you know, that we need <laughs> to protect. And, um, you know, of course, recognizing the other 70 isn't, isn't all paved and we're doing important things there as well. But these 30%, these they need to do many things. Um, and so we're really looking to those multi-benefit projects whenever possible. Um, yeah, to build off that a little bit, I was gonna talk about the multi-benefits and that's um, absolutely critical. Um, there's only so much time and so much money to do restoration projects and we have to make sure that we're getting the, you know, the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak. And we do look at the multi-benefits um, as, as one of those key criteria. When I think of resilience, and I, and I think of it in Nevada's context, um, Jennifer mentioned wetlands. You know, Nevada is largely a groundwater recharge state. Um, so just 
in the drought that we're in, you know, making sure that we have understanding regarding what is the water budget, where, where are we with groundwater resources in a changing climate, and being able to factor that in to our decisions, to me is that's a key component of resilience and making our decisions. We also look at resilience, you know, a lot of different lenses, and they're all correct. I think for my department, we really look at it from a wildfire perspective as well. Um, you know, like I said, the, the stats are staggering how much we're losing to wildfire. And um, we are the most mountainous state. Um, we're the basin and range. And every one of those ranges is different and depends on which aspect you go to. Some of those aspects might be more resilient than others. And so we have to use that resilience information because not all fire is bad, but we have to build that resilience into the landscape when we're making our, basically our priorities and where we're doing our pre-suppression work and also our suppression work. I'll, I'll just say, um, we talk about resilience a lot too in the climate and environment team. Um, generally, uh, if there was a definition, our teams would use the IPCC definition, which I will note is quite broad and can encompass both environmental and social resilience. Um, in general, though, I think the reason you don't hear any of us using it generically is because you always have to follow it by resilience to what, for what. And so the, the specifying always helps, and uh, we do a lot of that. And so there's a lot of emphasis in the climate environment team in working with federal agencies on planning for climate resilience on the climate side specifically, and helping them with climate services so that they have data on future risks, because a lot of federal agency planning still uses current risk estimates instead of future risks. So there's a lot of emphasis on that. Um, uh, Kim already mentioned one of the uh, interagency working groups uh, that focuses on resilience. There's five around climate that focus on different aspects of climate risk, um, and OSTP is involved in many of those. Um, I think just in general in these efforts, you know, we're trying to uh, bring the specificity and the scientific basis to inform discussions that do include resilience as a great concept um, that needs some specificity to be implemented. Yeah, thank you all for those uh, thoughtful comments, and I hope I didn't force all of our speakers this week to go back and look at their wording and be like, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to define that now, right? Um, let me... Uh, hey, Justin, I just wanted to jump in and say, sorry, can I do that? It's hard not to be there. Defining is really hard, so don't try it. I just wanted to say that. We spent a lot of time trying to define just one thing, and somebody said, why don't you have a glossary? And I thought, oh my God, it would take us 100 years to write that document. So. Editorializing. No, it's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so don't define it. Um, it's okay. It's still very useful. Um, you know, it's like diversity. Um, so with that, I wanted to turn uh, or give our audience a chance. And I'm not sure how we're going to field virtual questions if there are any out there. But um, I believe there's microphones in the audience. Is that correct? I can't see very well. There, oh, look at that. Hi. Wow. We have, wow, really so, great. We have a virtual question. We have a virtual question. Um, it came in, it said, local lead and voluntary sounds reasonable, but how are the interests interest of local persons safeguarded? After all, we are one nation or even one continent. For example, I live in Washington state, but I have an interest in the wildlife of Idaho. Am I only to have a voice in my state or local community? Yeah, would anyone like to, to jump in on that? The lo locally based, but, but uh, with obvious, like, probably all of us with interest in, in seeing positive action. Yeah, so um, I, I will note we, we did have a formal public comment period on the American Conservation and Stewardship Atlas, and I, I, I'm throwing this out there. This happened earlier this year because this was our attempt to get uh, public comment from around the country, and not necessarily just to inform locally led efforts, but the atlas, so something that is being um, built by the agencies in support of the America the Beautiful initiative. So I would say uh, input is certainly welcome on um, national scale, not just things that are going on in your lo local um, communities, um, but we are 
really, really interested in that input um, about the local communities and what we can do to better uplift um, like the federal families' efforts uh, at the local scale. So I, I wouldn't say that um, you're, you're not prevented from providing input um, in other areas, uh, but that we are definitely very much interested in what you have to say about um, your local community. Nothing like a softball question coming first right out of the audience. Um, so, I mean, and that's, I mean, that's such a great question, and, it, and it's really hard to answer. I, I, I just want to be honest. It, it is, there are so many differing opinions on how to get to a conservation goal that it is really hard to include everybody's input and make everybody feel like, you know, they were heard and it was going in the direction they thought. There are certainly a lot of processes for, for folks that aren't in that locally led area to provide input, whether it's at the federal level or the state level. And you know, I think the pandemic has taught us all new skills and tools and how to do that. And I think we're getting better at it. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, decisions still have to be made. And um, so I think it's, critical that at least we get some, that there's, you get commonality and consensus on what are the goals and objectives to be defined out of the America the Beautiful exercise. And some of that is still a little bit organic at this point in time. And so that's the best place, I think, for everybody to have an input on what are those common goals. Um, what I really do like about locally led is, you know, two things is, is one, sometimes it's the folks that are there on the ground that are living it every day that have the most valuable knowledge about what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. But when they're invested in conservation and they're living it, um, they're the ones that are going to take care of it for the durability aspect because um, all of us have seen too many times where really great projects are done. Um, but if they're not nurtured and if they're not maintained, then sometimes we lose the benefit, and that's another really huge benefit of the locally led. Yeah, thank you for that, Jim. And yeah, it's a tough question, but I would just also say, in, in my experience and observation, such the amazing thing to me about America the Beautiful and 30 by 30 is that, you know, it's not so much an an effort or an initiative as it is an incredible umbrella around what will likely be thousands of initiatives and efforts. And those span and will necessarily span the scales of local communities to regions to across states. And so I'm thinking about some of like the so many different programs, including things like working with tribes across Washington, Oregon, California, Idaho on beaver restoration for drought resilience. There I used resilience. But, you know, things or the incredible, which we won't even get into, the incredible philanthropic investment in these initiatives um, that really are reaching, they're, they're engaging local communities, but really thinking bigger and broader. And I think there's nothing really to keep any of us from jumping in wherever we are and, and engaging and trying to be a part of, of those efforts. I'll throw that out there. Looks like there's a question. Yes, thanks. First, I'd like to thank all of you for what you're doing. It's great to see there's such support for this at the federal and the state level. And given that the vast majority of these, of the new protected lands will have to be on private lands, could you talk a little more about the incentives that are available uh, to, to encourage uh, private landowners to take down fences, accept predators on their land, and all the things that will be necessary to, to achieve this goal. Um, you mentioned easements, but if you could talk a little more about that. And then just real quick, let's say we get an anti-regulatory Republican in the office in 2024. What happens to this act? OK, good and tough questions. Um. <laughs> We're getting, we're getting, yeah, high and tight fastballs. That's great. Thank you. And who would like to comment? Um. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to speak specifically about the USDA Big Game partnership with Wyoming that I 
mentioned it in response to one of the earlier questions um, and how that's drawing on multiple farm bill programs. So the three kind of um, areas that, that those are targeting are like agricultural land protection, so preventing the development of agricultural lands, like turning those into um, suburbs basically. Uh, and then there's also the restoration and management efforts on private landowner or private land, sorry. Um, and then finally, uh, there's also conservation leases. So I think those are the, the three that are covered um, through that partnership in particular. And um, I think you know we're interested in thinking of other ways that we can incentivize private landowners. And um, I know there are some conversations going on. Uh, around this at CEQ um, in, con in conjunction with um, some NGOs and private philanthropy, just thinking through um, what more we could be doing to incentivize more, more of this work on private lands. But Jim, I wonder if you have some additional examples you can tack on. Um, thank you. Um, you know, certainly conservation easements is, is kind of the most used tool, and I think the one that, that most folks are, are familiar with, and there's several programs, either statewide or, or nationwide, that have conservation easements as part of um, sort of the bucket of things to do. And it's only that's an incentive for folks to enroll. I, I do know landowners that just want to keep their land in the family for generations to come, and that's conservation easements are, are a great way um, to get mutual goals accomplished. Uh, another example, and I've mentioned it a couple times, is our conservation credit system for greater sage grouse. And that is basically, it's a scientific model that we use to value the functional acres of the landscape. And if a landowner enrolls their land in the system, um, they will get credits based on the, how many functional acres. And those credits can be then sold and retired for conservation purposes. Sometimes they're used for mitigation for anthropogenic disturbances um, in a less sensitive area. We've got it built so the mitigation has to be you know, greater and beyond. Um, but having that market-based system is really a good tool to get the folks involved. And I think there's probably going to be more of that as we move forward. Um, I think some, part of the question was also what happens if the administration changes. I don't know. Um, I'm not a federal person. Um, I, I do know that I, the, the way I look at this and the way I look at everything that we do in our department is we do everything with the idea that we're building a foundation for something that's going to carry on. Um, beyond this. And so when I mentioned our credit system, we've got place, we've got assurances in place that um, make sure it's going to be managed for 30 years, there's check-ins and they're reporting. So whether America the Beautiful lives on or not, our programs that we're doing to protect Nevada's landscape, they, they will continue forward. So. I'll just add a couple, a couple other examples of private land <clears throat> investment mechanisms. Um, in addition to the easements, which are in perpetuity, right, they're um, long-term legal uh, agreements over the land, there are shorter-term contracts through a lot of farm bill programs. So like the Conservation Reserve Program are 10 to 15-year contracts um, with private landowners to adopt specific practices on their lands. Um, and then there's other, I'm learning more myself about these, um, quite a lot of interactions with uh, military bases where they engage with neighboring communities and directly make investments that will increase resilience of both the community and the base. And there are a couple great examples on the Eastern Shoreboard where there are really major landscape scale joint planning efforts going on <clears throat> between counties and naval bases. Um, then they're jointly talking about and discussing investments that will be in restoration of coastal marshes, for example, that will reduce exposure to increased uh, flood risk from sea level rise and increased intensity storms. So those are um, different mechanisms that are you know, directly working with both local government and private landowners to make additional investments in, in restoration or conservation. Jen, did you want to add anything? No, I'm good. They covered it. Yeah, so I would just say, uh, just to summarize for that question, there are, yeah, mm -hmm. many examples, I think, and, and very recent examples with, using the Wyoming USDA investment of financial incentives, and along with many other incentives, but actually, yeah, payments to landowners to help compensate for the opportunity costs of 
um, of managing their land in ways that benefit you know, whole ecosystems and, and many others. Um, and yeah, I don't know if we're gonna be able to solve the question about what happens in future administrations. I would say uh, Robert Bonney, who is the USDA undersecretary, is that correct? Was, before that, was uh, uh, based at Yale University and conducted a big study on rural attitudes towards conservation. And it, it, won't, it won't surprise this group, though I think it makes me ask, on behalf of all of us, what we need to do better, but found that, um, not surprisingly, there's overwhelming bipartisan support across America for conservation, right? For land, particularly land conservation. Um, you know, upwards of 70 something percent of people are strongly supportive. And so, you know, you hope um, that we can get to the point together where that 70 plus percent of, of uh, agreement across, across our country actually creates uh, resilience in these ideas. So next question. Uh, hi, everyone. So thanks uh, to all the panelists. Um, there have been some really encouraging statements that have come out um, from today. Um, but one thing that I just uh, wanted to address is sort of the big elephant in the room, at least for me, in 30 by 30 discussions that hasn't been talked about is the um, potential for perverse outcomes from area-based conservation targets. And so we know from past targets like IG-11 um, that when the sites are really placed on something as arbitrary as an area-based target without any science driving that percentage target, what we can see is that decision makers, um, political leaders really have their sights on the wrong number. And it's that percentage target and it's not about impacts on the ground. And so Heather gave um, some really encouraging statements about you know, shifting the conversation around outcomes and outcome-focused frameworks. But also when I hear conversations about, you know, we don't have time to choose what's the best place. We would rather do something now that maybe isn't as good um, because it will, it'll get us to that target faster. So I'm just wondering if the panel can kind of discuss, you know, are there safeguards in place to make sure that, you know, if we don't hit that 30% target, it's okay because really our focus is about impacts and not about just protecting large slots of land just to sort of meet this arbitrary target. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Would someone like to? I definitely want to jump in because <laughs> I made the statement about not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, but I, I really want to make sure you're not left with the impression that it's just any acres that matter. In California, we went to a lot of trouble. My 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 quip about definitions was was referencing, in fact, how hard it was to come up with a definition for what would count towards our 30% goal. And we as a team reworked that section no fewer than 20 times trying to really capture this, this idea that biodiversity conservation is first and foremost. Yes, we also want to advance access to nature. Yes, we also want to use land to address climate change, but we want to make sure that when we're doing this conservation, biodiversity is at the front of our minds and that it's durably protected in perpetuity, ideally. Um, in our document, we go through, uh, you know, what does it mean to protect biodiversity and identify um, what conservation priorities we want to target as we um, protect these lands. So conservation biology principles are actually throughout our document and in particular when we identify these priorities, you know, the highest, the places with the highest biodiversity, the places that will be resilient, had to use the word, in the you know, face of climate change, um, large areas, but also, you know, wildlife corridors, you don't get a lot of acres necessarily out of a wildlife corridor, but you're going to make much more functional um, systems. So I encourage you to take a look at our document. Um, and uh, I would just say that I think that we need to be, oh, I know what else I want to say. That, you know, we also identified sort of a suite of programs that where the funding will support this, this work. And those programs are all, you know, you don't get the money unless the program, the project is actually advancing meaningful conservation. So we're not going to just fund, 
you know, parking lots and call them 30 by 30 conservation areas. We're putting our funds in the programs that actually deliver meaningful um, protected areas at the, at the end of the day. So I think the only point I was trying to make is that the science isn't perfect. We don't know exactly where all the best biodiversity hotspots are. We haven't inventoried every last taxa and we are definitely flying blind when it comes to climate change. Um, we have some good guesses, um, but it's very difficult to figure out where are the places we need to conserve next so that they're in place in 20 years when we need them, when right now maybe there isn't biodiversity in those spots, but it could be there in the future. I think we don't have the tools for that, both from a policy perspective and I think our science, um, there's still a lot of work to do. So for all of you out there looking for a, a dissertation project, I would invest my time there if, if I could. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I'll just add, like, if you listen to Jen's response, she listed like 12 other criteria that are in consideration. And to me, that just emphasizes the point that I, I think it's fair to say that no one has identified it a politically viable and scientifically robust alternative to an area-based goal. That's why there's area-based goals in the global biodiversity framework, and that's why it's what the president put his emphasis behind in driving conservation forward. So I leave that to you all as a serious challenge. Right? Biodiversity isn't species. There's been some good research that shows some correlation between species uh, area curves and the 30% target, but we all know species is in all of biodiversity, right? There's ecosystems, there's functions, there's resilience, there's corridors, there's all the other things that Jen's mentioned. And there's not yet a quantitative target that's been put forward that, po that political actors could get behind that gets us out of the area-based target space. So I know there's been lots of discussions about this and lots of partial ideas put forward, and I, I just turn it back to you all as a community that's full of incredibly creative, thoughtful, smart, intelligent people um, to, con to continue to push on this space right, and be the forefront of driving these kinds of frameworks forward. Because uh, again, I, I, I think it is fair to say there isn't a very viable alternative right now to an area-based target. Yeah, thank you. I'll just thank you for, it's an important question, and I know a question that everyone here thinks about. And I'll just say, as someone who has engaged dozens and more folks working on these issues at state, federal, and, and international levels, that I'm yet to encounter any single person who says, damn it, all that matters is that we get to this goal by 2030, that's what matters. I'm yet to encounter anyone who said that. And in fact, I don't want to, you know, out, out anybody here, but what I've heard much more often is it's about the journey, it's about the awareness, and it's about the relationships and the momentum we build along the way in doing meaningful things. Um, so yeah, I haven't heard, for example, oh, we just need to forcibly move those people out of there and we'll get to that point. I mean, that would be, any meeting I've ever been a part of would immediately come to a stop um, if anything like that were to come about. But it's still a very important, important question. And the next question. Thank you. I think my question's most directed at Jan Norris and, and Mr. Lawrence, and it's about the role of state wildlife action plans in, a comp in achieving the goals of 30 by 30. As most of us know, in 2025, most states will be uh, creating their third congressionally mandated state wildlife action plan that is a decade-long blueprint for conservation in those states. But Nevada, of course, is ahead of the game and will be producing theirs a little earlier. And um, so my question is two parts, actually. What is the role of state wildlife action plans in helping to achieve 30 by 30? And then specifically, on a regional basis, in the Northeast and in the Southeast and in the Midwest, we've had uh, efforts for those states in those regions to get together and say, across state borders, these are the species that are the most important to us, and so that we have uh, sort of multi-jurisdictional conservation priorities that are uh, manifesting in state wildlife action plans, and that is not happening yet in the West. And so I'm interested in regional efforts for states to work across boundaries in the Western US, and what that role of state wildlife action plans will be, especially when 
Recovering America's Wildlife Act passes and we're putting over a billion dollars a year into state coffers to actually implement those state wildlife action plans. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jennifer and Jim, that was directed at you, so. Um, thank you, that's a great, e excellent questions. Um, first with the state wildlife action plan, so, yeah, um, I am the acting director of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. We basically do everything except for the Department of Wildlife, who does the wildlife action plan. So I'm a little bit over my skis on this one. Um, but I will say that, you know, the Department of Wildlife is a tremendous partner to everything that we do out in the resource and for, for my department. And I see those swaps, the state wildlife action plans, as being very key and critical and absolutely should be very informative. Um, I know my conversations with Director Wasley um, when he talks about um, both the, the wildlife action plan and the possibilities of RAWA um, coming forward, um, definitely look at these action plans as a key blueprint to making some of the decisions, particularly when it comes to connectivity in particular, because that's where you can really get to some of those larger landscape decisions on how we protect the, the landscape. So, um, at least from a Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resource view, that's, that's certainly how I see how critical those wildlife action plans are going to be into the decision making. Yeah, I would echo that, you know, actually, um, in fact, California is about to launch their uh, their next uh, their next state wildlife action plan process with some public engagement. And I've already been talking to Department of Fish and Wildlife about um, how we can make sure that's geared toward informing our 30 by 30. <clears throat> but importantly, when I talked earlier about the statewide map and our biodiversity information across the state, you know, that all came from the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the State Wildlife Action Plan is a key piece of them identifying their conservation priorities and their areas of conservation emphasis across the state. So it's, it's effectively integrated into our baseline information. And at the same time, the programs that we're um, supporting to achieve 30 by 30. So if you imagine you have a project and you come to our Wildlife Conservation Board as, as one of the big funders, and you want to, you have a pro, you know, a place you want to conserve and you're asking for money. One of the questions is, you know, what, what priorities does this support? What plan is behind selecting these places? Um, and state wildlife action plans are a key way to emphasize that you've sort of thought through um, that you're protecting an important spot. And I would say your question about regional uh, partnerships is a really good one. Of course, you know, California, if you put it over the Eastern seaboard, that would be like, six states or more. So we're sort of, we're doing it across ecosystems across our state, trying to uh, think about those key priorities. But at the same time, we do work closely with Nevada and Oregon with those species that cross the border that are super sensitive, like sage grouse, like um, the Klamath Basin, especially. So I, you know, I think it, it's maybe less formalized, but it's, it's certainly something that's under consideration and important as we think about what we want to um, protect moving forward. I want to thank you very much for that question. And um, I know there are more folks who'd like to ask questions. And unfortunately, we need to wrap up. We're now standing between all of you and the, the bar and other things, slot machines, uh, whatever. So um, with that, I would like to give a profound thank you on behalf of all of us here to Heather, Kim, Jim, and uh, Jennifer. Thank you very much. I, I would just yeah, thank you. I'd just also add that um, come up and ask your questions or join us in the next, in the adjoining room for the social hour and let's keep talking and we'll ch chase these folks around if they're willing to hang out a bit and ask uh, more tough questions. Um, it's an important topic and uh, so let's stay on it. Well, thanks. Oh, this, okay. Back to this one. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Um, just to wrap up here um, after this, again, uh, we are moving in to our evening reception here. So um, I just wanted to point out as we move forward, 
that we do have um, a slide here that shows um, some of the other sessions that organized symposia uh, focused on 30 by 30 and different issues. Uh, so for those of you that are interested in this, um, there's a lot more discussion to come. There's also some other contributed talks that might not be captured in here. So take a look at your programs and a lot more discussion in this area. And then I also wanted to highlight um, that this is the first of three uh, hopefully really thought-provoking and interesting plenaries. And so we have another one tomorrow and then another one on Wednesday. And those are both morning plenaries, 10.30 to 12. So we really look forward to seeing you all there. So it's time to wrap up here um, and move towards our evening reception. I hope you can all join us. Uh, just a tiny housekeeping. Um, you're welcome to bring food out onto the plaza and um, non-alcoholic drinks, but if you're gonna be enjoying the bar, um, please keep your drinks inside. And with that, uh, I look forward to continuing all these conversations in the other room. Thank you very much. Yeah.